I request everyone to kindly assemble in the auditorium. Good afternoon to all respected dignitaries, delegates, and young minds. Namaste to all. This session will throw light on urban exilism, a threat to national security, and cultural attack on social media by our two eminent speakers. I, on behalf of the organizing team of Prabuddha Bharat, take the honor to introduce guests for this session. Starting with the first speaker for this session, Dr. Prasanna Ambadas Deshpande ji. Assistant Professor in the Department of English, Ferguson College, Pune. Sir has published articles in Indian Express, Organizer, Taran Bharat, and Vivek Saptahik. While has also delivered lectures on various topics related to academics of humanities at more than 100 places. Prasanna ji has also authored a book, Dis-Indianizing Indians, published by India Policy Foundation, New Delhi. Sir has been awarded PhD from Savitri Bai Phule University, Pune, has studied the translated novels of S.L. Bhairappa for PhD. Welcome, sir. While the second speaker for this session is Srimati Priyanka Dio, after completing master's degree from Howard, the London School of Economics and Political Science and the University of Southern California. Priyanka Dio is now Chief Manager at the Times of India Group and host of digital show Core Questions by the Times of India. She has previously worked for TV9 Networks and for PM Modi's election campaign. Srimati Priyanka has also worked in strategic communications in Washington, D.C and her work has been published across multiple digital platforms in the USA and India. Priyanka Ji was also a ranked tennis player and has competed internationally. I welcome you, ma'am. While the moderator of this session is Ms. Ms. Pooja Porwal, a serial fintecher and currently working as the COO and blockchain strategist for Credian Networks, I request Ms. Pooja to take over. Thank you, Lavanya. A very good afternoon to everyone present. It gives me honor both to share the stage with a power-packed panel and to also welcome you for the next session. Counterterrorism is a fight between justice and evil civilization and savagery. Urban Naxal doctrine and modus operandi is not very different from the mainstream terrorism. To enlighten us more on this topic, I invite Dr. Prasanna Deshpande ji to speak on this very timely subject. Welcome you, sir. Thank you so much. My co-panelist, Priyanka, the moderator. And we have heard the word the August gathering almost 78 times since morning. So right now, I am really conscious of one thing. You as an audience and me as a speaker here, both of us are equally burdened. It's a post-lunch session. And you know, the most interesting fact about the post-lunch session is that the audience can always have their liberty because they are the audience. Whereas the speaker, although the speaker too has had lunch, which was quite sumptuous and delicious with, with that big rounded black gulab jamun. So, and managing intellectual, managing intellectual discussion against that, that that's going to be a tough challenge for me indeed. I'll just try, that's why I said wish me luck. And thank you so much. You wish me luck. The topic which has been given to me, to cut it short, is urban naxalism. Uh, thanks to uh, Mr. Agnihotri, who popularized the 
uh, phrase through his movies and I'm sure most of you must be familiar with uh, that movie on Kashmir and, uh, and also the role that was played by um, Mrs. Pallavi Zoshi uh, and that was uh, of course an excellent acting on her part and the entire movie is great. First of all, it's great as a movie, okay? So we are generally aware of this word called urban nationalism, and then we try to associate it with what the moderator happened to mention as, you know, some kind of terrorism, some kind of threat to national security and stuff like that. Well, as a teacher of literature and as a student of cultural studies and humanities and social studies and um, social sciences and political science, I would like to present before you not really the national security perspective or the law enforcement perspective of the entire problem, but more the academic perspective of what the actual situation is. And that will require us to know a bit of the history of or the trajectory of, you know, what came to us as urban nationalism. Well, to the best of my understanding, there is no such distinction between urban nationalism and rural nationalism. Nationalism is all one, number one. The urban nationalism became popular because those who happened to endorse a particular ideology and a particular sort of activism, whether in campus or on the street or in the parliament or anywhere, the practitioners of Antifa and, you know, whatever happened at, you know, on 9th of February, 2015 at JNU in the name of cultural evening, Bharat Tere Tukde Honge, blah, blah. Whatever happened in the name of, you know, the activism that started off in the Central University Hyderabad or the uh, Periyar Andolan that uh, erupted in, in, in IIT Chennai and so on. And so from Jadopur to JNU, JNU and Ferguson College in Pune, in Ranade Institute, all over the country, uh, the campus activism that happened and also recently the farmer strike that happened. So all over the country we find that there is an attempt by a section of a society, by a section of the academicians and also some politicians, by some writers and poets and authors and film makers also. So all of them, they, they, they are assembling and they are concentrated entirely on something called creating some kind of political insurgencies through, surprisingly enough, not only through politics, but through different avenues and channels and di different fields of work and the fields in which they are working. That was something which kind of gave us an understanding that, well, the nationalism that I always knew that used to happen, um, you know, some kind of violent act on the part of some Adivasis who are not happy with the system and they would target the system and that movement in India, it, it, it got to be termed as nationalism. So that was our general understanding, but then primarily it, it all used to happen only in the rural areas. And the urban locations, they were kind of detached or they were unaware and they didn't know what was going on and they would always say that, well, there is no development, government ne kuch development nahi kiya hai and that is why those people are upset with it and that is why those people are targeting the government, they are targeting the government officials. This is how, as common people, we got, you know, we got to know something about nationalism and then all of a sudden this urban nationalism came in. To the best of my understanding, I'll repeat, nationalism is all one. This whole categorization, it's somewhat a product of, or it's a result of some sort of analytical approach to the whole situation. In reality, nationalism is the same old ideology, it's the same old modus operandi, and it's the so same old movement that started up some time ago in Naxalbari in West Bengal, and Kanu Sanyal was one of the founders of that nationalite movement. And in Naxalbari, that movement started off because some peasants, farm workers, they were the victims of the exploitation of some local zamindars, and they rallied against the zamindars, and that is how the movement started off. Basically, the ideology has the same old name, which had taken the entire world under its influence for quite some time. We identify it as socialism or communism. 
but when the global players of communism and socialism you know when they were interested in india way back at the start of you know the 20th century roughly the second decade of the 20th century that is the most crucial period when communism started coming our way in india i'm referring to a great revolutionary manavendranath roy Manavendranath Roy was not just a revolutionary he was not just the founder of the communist party of india but mn roy manavendranath roy he was one of the uh, one of the great scholars that the country has produced our own dattopant thengri ji in his epoch making work the third way mentions mn roy in the preface and that is not for nothing mn roy was a prolific writer Emin Roy was a typically Indian thinker with a very strong understanding of indigenous traditions of thought and ideas and Emin Roy was a great revolutionary also and Emin Roy did envision for a better India but something went wrong with the movement 1920s was the period when Emin Roy founded the communist party of india well he was also the founder of the mexican communist party the communist party of mexico was founded by mn roy the entire literature that is written by mn roy it runs into almost 8000 pages he was a great visionary he was a great thinker and a revolutionary too unfortunately the period before independence when you turn the pages of history backwards that was the period when some other leaders they dominated the indian independence movement Emin Roy he did not have that recognition he just couldn't have that recognition Lenin was in touch with Emin Roy Emin Roy used to write letters to Lenin and in one of such letters Lenin had actually wanted Emin Roy to support the Indian freedom movement which was being led by Gandhi at that time but there was another faction in the Russian Communist Party and that faction was led by stalin and stalin was against mn roy's support stalin was against raising that support extending that support to the indian freedom movement because stalin did not agree with the overall argument of the chale jao movement the overall argument and the demand and even the leadership of gandhi stalin's approach was very myopic Stalin's approach was very classical in nature his approach was very provincial he was sort of he was sort of an ardent and a blind follower of just the pothi and puran of karl marx and marxism and that is why stalin has had made it clear to mn roy that because because this movement for freedom in india is not being led in his perception it was not being led by the peasants or the working class population it should not be supported that was the argument of stalin and there the indian communist party went berserk and it went off track mn roy's leadership was questioned mn roy was interested in extending the support but communists in india missed the first opportunity ever to extend their support to the indian freedom movement that is why until the british left the country the communists did not support mn roy's leadership was questioned whenever we study the history of india this is very surprising and shocking to see that nowadays when the left inclined journalists and the left inclined politicians they say that rss never had a support and rss never participated into the indian freedom movement well you track down the entire history you will find that every worker of rss back then even the founder the very founder of rss dr keshav bairam hedge were himself he was a revolutionary and he did work against the colonization or the colonial project of the british to cut it short what started off in europe say in the second half of 19th century what started off in europe as a reaction against the crony capitalism the rampant industrial progress and the socio cultural aftermath of this 
reckless industrialization of Europe that happened in the second half of the 19th century, Karl Marx emerged on the scene with his Communist Manifesto in 1848. That was the breakthrough for the world to understand something of the sort of socialism and communism. And then Marx gave that call to the world, may the workers of the world unite and launch a proletariat revolution against the world, against the capitalist and so on and so forth. Karl Marx is studied and acknowledged today unquestionably is the father and the pioneer and the founder of what you and I understand as socialism and communism. And the style of his work or you know what he had envisioned as the result of his work was absolute equality, fraternity and what not in the society. In reality what happened? I would like to share something with you. I don't know, I mean, if some of you really know that, hats off to you. Karl Marx, when he was propagating the ideas of socialism and his followers, they were approaching the ideas of socialism as given by Karl Marx as the only source of creating a better world. While this was happening in Europe, Karl Marx in 1853, he wrote one article in Daily Tribune, June 25, 1853. This New York Daily Tribune is today's Times Magazine. When our Sachin Tendulkar's photograph gets published on the front page, on the cover page of the Times Magazine, all of us we feel proud that yes, our Sachin on Times Magazine. It's the same Times Magazine which used to function back then as New York Daily Tribune, June 25, 1853. The article written by Karl Marx, title of the article, British rule in India. Socialism and communism of the Marxian canonical type, canonical, classical Marxian socialism, which was introduced and is being introduced and is being facilitated and disseminated through academics in India as the only solution for the socio-cultural issues that we face here in India. Okay, that Marxism, which was being propounded by Karl Marx himself, the same old Karl Marx, look at the audacity of Karl Marx when he talks about India, what a tremendous exhibition of absolute, absolutely bovine and stupid logic, I must say, that he seems to have adopted when he, you know, when he mentioned and talked about India. And I'm quoting Karl Marx. Just look at, look at his thoughts about India. What did Karl Marx think about India? I quote him. English interference, having placed the spinner in Lancashire and the weaver in Bengal, or sweeping away both Hindu spinner and weaver, dissolved these small semi-barbarian, semi-civilized communities. Karl Marx used to think that India is a semi-barbaric and a semi-civilized society. Interestingly, his logic was that India does not have well-established capitalist systems. That is why India is a semi-barbaric society. On the contrary, what India always had was its own fabric and its own network of its own indigenous industry, which was far away from the benefits and even the losses of capitalism. In spite of that, the father of socialism, the so-called father of socialism, further goes on saying, in his article, he further says, semi-civilized communities, by blowing up their economical basis, He's thanking the English for blowing up the economic basis of the Indian indigenous markets, especially the weavers in Bengal. And thus produce the greatest and to speak the truth, the only social revolution ever heard of in Asia. This is like there is a jungle and there is an exquisite natural beauty over there. You visit that jungle. You are not happy to see that beauty which is not created artificially by any human being with any human intervention. So you walk in the jungle with a JCB, 
you raise down the trees you destroy the beauty of the jungle and you say if somebody asks you why are you doing that why are you destroying the beauty of that jungle you say i want to build a garden here karl marx says india doesn't have its own capitalist systems he thanks the british government for establishing the well uh designed capitalist structures over there and then he feels happy that that shall provide us a ground to launch a socialist revolution after you establish your capitalist agenda the east india company it won a lot of praise from karl marx classical marxism classical marxism never succeeded in keeping the promises that it made i'm not putting that blame entirely on karl marx see that guy was not a bad guy whatever he did and whatever he thought it was probably appropriate in the context of europe the socio cultural imbalance which had got created in europe all of a sudden as the aftermath of the industrial revolution he somebody was needed to think of some solution karl marx they found karl marx to think of certain solutions the problem is the gatekeepers of indian education society the gatekeepers of indian education and those academicians in india who prevent those ideas that must come to india from all over the world because we all are aware of you know what the injunction the most popular injunction of rigveda there ano bhadra kartavo yantu vishvata but the gatekeepers they don't allow some ideas to enter and those marxist gatekeepers they allow only those ideas to enter and settle in our academics those ideas which will eventually lead to disruption in the society and some or other kind of political cultural insurgency on our campus on our streets and eventually they want to create a similar insurgency in the parliament see since morning we have been talking about devas and manavas and ayodhya and varanasi is and this glorious past of our country the task which has been assigned to me is to talk about the asuras and and that is why i am that is why i am referring to that is why i am referring to the modus operandi of the asuras that is what that is what they have been doing to cut the long story short how much time is left yes i'll just wrap it up in 5 or 10 minutes to cut the long story short against the call given by karl marx may the workers of the world unite and launch a proletariat revolution against the world no workers united to launch a proletariat revolution in fact in most of the european countries if you track down the history of the western european nations at that time the workers did unite not to launch a revolution or a socialist revolution they did unite to participate in the national economy through the industrial means and they made their respective european nations economic powers superpowers did you understand marx and marxism and marxist marxian socialism and communism failed miserably do you think that the marxist intellectuals in europe they would sit calm you know on one hand this was happening in europe on the other hand the russian revolution they were still trying to understand they were groping into darkness they were still trying to understand whether russian revolution should be considered as our achievement or as our failure came 1950s the whole world saw after stalin ran over tanks over millions of people in hungary budapest and whatever you know we we, we talk about the holocaust and the genocide that happened in uh, germany at the hands of the nazis but we never talk we never talk about the genocide and the immense massacre and the loss of the mankind that happened at the hands of these capitalists communists dictators in russia that is why in 1920s there was another gentleman in italy antonio gramsci who probably got frustrated with this classical marxism classical socialism and then he came up with an idea called cultural marxism which we nowadays understand today in different names as you know urban nationalism and what not what did gramsci do gramsci basically attacked marx's idea of economic determinism some of this might sound a little like a jargon but i can't help it for a simple reason that this is exactly what i do as a part of my profession every day 45 minutes lecture today it has been cut down to 35 minutes 5 minutes last 5 minutes left 
I'll repeat what I said. I'll repeat what I said. Classical Marxism, socialism, is founded on economic determinism. What does it mean by economic determinism? To simplify it in layman's terms, economic determinism means the value and the worth and the significance of your and my life, it will be understood only by the means of one logic. What is that logic? Baap badana bhaiya, sabse bada. That's it. Economic determinism. Everything that we do, everything that we do, all our socio, cultural, academic, judicial institutions, all institutions of the civil society, all institutions of an urban society, all those institutions are driven by a single logic and that logic is the logic of economy. So, for example, in a family, the pater familias, <coughs> the father in the family, the head of the family is respected not because there is any warmth or attachment or there is any sense of relationship or bonding. The pater familias is respected because he is the sole bread earner of the family. The moment he stops earning the bread for the family, respect will end. Economic determinism. Gramsci did not appreciate this whole idea of economic determinism. Gramsci turned Marx's model upside down. Gramsci said proletariat revolution will not work. Economic determinism will not work. Base and superstructure model will not work. So Gramsci came up with his own understanding, his own version of the revolution. Gramsci said classical Marxism will not do. Cultural Marxism could be a solution. So he says we are not rejecting Marx, we are modifying Marx. How did they modify Marx? That's interesting. Who was the proletariat in Marxian canon? What do you understand by a proletariat? Workers. There were workers unions. So whenever the workers, they, they had to take some panga with the capitalist class, they would call on a strike and they will stop working. Then there will be rallies, stone pelting, Streets will be closed. There will be sump, strikes, calm band. Understand? This logic did not work. Gramsci said, economic determinism will not work. We need to come up with a new solution. Cultural Marxism as a result of Gramsci's vision. Gramsci gave new proletariats. And I'll stop here. I'll just mention the new proletariats and that explains the entire issue of the so-called urban nationalism. According to Gramsci, Gramsci was uh, imprisoned by Mussolini. Gramsci was the, Antonio Gramsci was the founder of the Communist Party of Italy. He was kept in prison. In the prison, he wrote one book, Prison Notebook, as simple as that. In that book, Gramsci talks about these neo-proletariats. One, according to Gramsci, the revolution, the dream of the revolution was a big failure because Marx had concentrated entirely on workers. Interestingly, it was in the same period that entire Europe witnessed the strategic retreat of the trade union and the workers' union. Now the workers stopped working. And according to Gramsci's philosophy, the attention was shifted from the workers in the mills and the factory to could you tell me another such institution or another such establishment where you could have maximum number of young people who could be indoctrinated and who could be provoked to launch a revolution this time for a change, not for that economic determinism problem, not for that house and house not wala gap, but this time this revolution will be launched in the name of number one, minorities and the total and the total injustice that happens against the minorities, the total injustice that happens against the women, the total injustice that happens against the youth, and the total injustice that happens against the underprivileged sections of the society, the neo-proletariats of Antonio Gramsci. Result, kiss of love andolan, New Delhi, in front of the Jandewala RSS office. Result, cultural evening, JNU, 5.30 p.m. Title of the program was, name of the program was Cultural Evening. The revolution that happened in China, you and I understand it, the name of that revolution is Cultural Revolution. In 1956, they founded one Birmingham Center of Cultural Studies and Critical Theories, Stuart Hall and Raymond Williams, they founded that center in uh, Birmingham, London. 
the name of that center was Birmingham Center for Cultural Studies. Last but not the least, Stuart Hall's quote from one of his essays, Theoretical Legacies of Cultural Studies. Stuart Hall was one of the founders of this cultural studies discipline. And I quote him, our aim is not to study culture. Our aim is to make one. Making of a new culture can happen through these neo-proletariats of Gramsci, hence the agitation through films, songs, plays, poems, mass communication, journalism, academics, and all these lousy theories and critical thinking uh, patterns which are being introduced in our education system. There is a solution to that. Because of the paucity of time, I shall not indulge into an elaborate discussion on the solution. I'll just cut it short here. I'll only say this here. Are there really some gaps in our society? And are there really some fault lines in our society? Like in any other society in the world, there are some fault lines in our society also. Though my only point of contention is, for every problem of yours, you need not import a solution in the name of either Marxian socialism or Gramscian socialism or even liberalism. Somebody mentioned Fukuyama in the previous session. The same Fukuyama last month gave a new book in which he has refuted his own theories and he has written about the liberalism and the discontents about liberalism. The same Fukuyama has refuted his own theories. Last but not the least, we need to develop an attitude, first of all, to diagnose our problems our ways and also to understand and accept our responsibility that whatever inequalities are there and whatever injustices are there in our society, we need to rectify them and we need to come up with some solutions which will always last as the indigenous solutions for the indigenous problems. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Deshpandi ji, for the thought-provoking session. People without knowledge of their own history, past, and origin of their culture is more like a tree without roots. And to address the gathering on cultural attack on social media, I now invite Priyanka Deoji to carry forward with the next session. Thank you for that introduction. Thank you to my panelists, and thanks for the organizers for having me here. I think, I guess, uh, if I can describe myself, I'm a new proletariat, right? As Professor said, uh, I am a journalist and uh, originally from the US, uh, born in India, but went to the US and then came back. Uh, it's a very tough topic to talk about. It's a very heavy topic to talk about. Uh, and the timing, I'm not sure, is correct, because I think the gulab jamun is setting in with everyone right now, right? But I'll give it a shot, right? So I'm here today to talk about the cultural attack happening on social media in India. Uh, I think as we all know, social media has become pretty much an integral part of our lives. How many of you are on Instagram? Little engagement, people are falling asleep here. Everyone, Twitter, Snapchat, <laughs> anything else besides the three I've named, Facebook, Google, you guys use Google. How many of you guys use ChatGPT? Professors, you should pay attention. These are the... <laughs> right, so you guys all know and you guys are pretty much aware and I'm sure everyone has told you that with great power comes great responsibility, right? But unfortunately, as a lot of us have seen, some people are using this power to spread hate and division. This is at least from what I have noticed. I moved back to India from Washington DC in 2018, and here are some of the things I've seen. So in recent times, within the past three, four years, we've seen an increase in the number, I would say, of cultural attacks, as Professor referred to at the end of his speech, happening on social media platforms in India as well. Now these attacks are not only damaging to, I would say, the cultural fabric of our society, but they are also a threat to our national unity and integrity. The rise of these attacks is a worrying trend, and we must take, I would say, immediate action to curb them. The question is how. 
Let me first talk about the reasons that I feel these attacks are taking place in the first place. A large reason is you guys have heard the misinformation. You guys have heard about this, right? Misinformation on social media, misinformation in media, uh, people selling wrong stories, people selling clickbait on media. You guys have all heard about this, right? These are the discussions that are happening in every large media group. And we're trying to figure out why. I would say that the impact of this, right, as a citizen, especially someone who's of Indian origin moved back to India, the impact of this is that it creates a sense of fear. Uh, like during the Delhi riots, I was in Delhi, and a lot of my friends and family were actually calling to see, like, are you alive? What's happening over there, right? It creates a lot of sense of fear. The farmer protests, I think, was uh, they had shut down the roads for how many months? Uh, six months, eight months, uh, settled down over there, uh, blocked everything. So it was taking about, I think I was four months pregnant at that time. It took about four and a half hours to get to work and back. So I was spending about nine hours on the road. So it does have an impact on our everyday lives. More than that, there is a growing sense of fear suspicion and, I would say, intolerance towards people who are, I would say, different from us, right? When I came to India in 2018, I had a handful of followers on my, well, I was on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, right? On an, each one, I had a handful of followers. Twitter being the main one, let me refer to that one. I think I had 30 followers, and two of them were my mom and my dad. So, <laughs> who I would force to be like, they didn't know what Twitter was, they had never used it before, so I was like, Dad, go on Twitter, see my thing, like it. It was mainly me controlling his phone, right? I started a YouTube channel for the purpose of, I came down because I was asked to help with the Modi election campaign, the Lok Sabha elections 2019. So I was on his communications team. But besides that, my job primarily on the campaign was to talk to youth across the country and to understand their issues. So I was talking to youth in Amiti, I was talking to youth in Mumbai, I was talking to youth in Delhi, in South India, in North India, all over the place, right? I think I interviewed about, I would say, 400,000 young people, right? Now, what was expected of me was to write down all of these answers, right? And I just got lazy because you can't keep up, right? By the 399,999 person, your hand was pretty much broken. So I started recording everyone. And some of the recordings were so good that we started posting it on social media, right? There were real youth, real issues. What you guys feel are the most important to you? What affects you in your daily lives? This is what I was asking youth. And this is information for the, for the campaign. When we started posting them, I said, hey, can we do a few other things? Can we start a YouTube channel? Can we, you know, I, I have a degree in journalism. Can I use it? Can I make some mini documentaries? Can I? So they said, well, if it's within the budget, which was nothing, uh, you sure can, right? So I went with a camera, uh, which was this, actually. And if you see my phone, you'll see the cracks. So people are like, you know, get a new phone. But I was like, you don't know the history that has gone on with this phone. We went all over the country. We were the first YouTube team to go to uh, Jammu Kashmir after Article 370. Um, and by team, I mean me, my camera person, and the video editor, because we needed to edit the videos on the spot. So there were just three of us wandering around. And our YouTube channel, I guess, started with, I think, two people. I think you can guess who they are, which was my mom and my dad, right? Then it was me, so number three me liking my own videos, right? But less than a year later, because of what we were covering, our aim was to cover positive development across the country, right? So I was covering stories of positive development as well as highlighting issues of youth across the country. And within less than a year, we, our work actually was shared by Prime Minister Narendra Modi on his social media handles, personally. So nothing is impossible. And I mentioned this because during this journey, I found some things that were really shocking uh, in terms of cultural attack, right? So now, who, uh, who has a phone on them right now? I don't have any internet. You guys all have phones, right? I'm assuming. Or you guys didn't bring your phones here. Just go on Wikipedia and Google Delhi, Delhi attacks or Delhi riots 2020. Someone have it? And I'd like someone to read the first sentence because it's quite surprising, actually. Who has it? Quick, guys. 
Ah, for social media experts, everyone is slow. <laughs> Who has it? Just raise your hand. You want to display it? Right. The 2020 Delhi riots were multiple waves of bloodshed, property destruction, and rioting in Northeast Delhi beginning in Feb 2020 and caused chiefly by Hindu mobs attacking Muslims. So untrue, right? Misinformation about COVID-19. That was another one, right? Do you guys remember uh, one guy put out that migrants are supposed to uh, gather over here? They had thousands of migrants gather in one place, which was the wrong location. It became a super spreader and people died with just one guy, right? Fake news is also related to political issues, right? There have been several instances since I've been here of fake news being spread on social media during political campaigns and elections in India, the US elections, President Trump, you guys all know this. But another factor contributing to these cultural attacks is the rise of divisive politics. And that first sentence right there is exactly divisive politics. What's dangerous here is radical ideologists. Being radical, I would say either way, is not good. But the cultural attack in India is something that cannot be ignored anymore. And this is because extremist ideologies are aiming to destroy the foundation of our families, as Professor also referred to, and the foundation of our nation, Bharat. I just tweeted this the other day. I, don't, I really don't understand how someone from India, someone from India can be anti-India, right? If you go to Pakistan, and will you ever meet someone that says, I'm anti-Pakistani? What would happen to them if they say that out loud? Think, just think about it. If you go to America, right, whether you're they have very divisive politics over there, but if someone is a Democrat or a Republican, you never hear anyone saying, I'm anti-America, right? There are repercussions. So why does this anti-India sentiment exist? And how do we defeat this cultural attack? I feel that this is the cultural attack that we need to pay attention to. And I really feel that the answer starts with the individual. So that's basically you and I. We're all on social media. And like I said, you know, we think that these ideas are really big. But I think it just starts with one, two followers, mom, dad, whatever, yourself. If you're liking your own videos, there's nothing wrong with that, right? But it does start with the individual. When you are able to see things objectively, when you're able to show things objectively just as they are, that's a very powerful thing. There are many people that shout, especially I saw during the campaign, Modi is great, Modi is great, Modi is great, right? Many people that shout Rahul Gandhi is great, Rahul Gandhi is great. But how many people do you know can give you 10 legitimate reasons for why they support Modi, for why they support Rahul Gandhi, right? And which one of those two people are you gonna take seriously, right? You may not agree with them, but at least you'll respect them, right? And you can agree to disagree. I was working in consulting in Washington, D.C. Um, basically, it was a very high paycheck, and I, was, I got to basically do a lot of shopping, right? So I was very happy with the job. So every Saturday, Sunday, I was like, hey, let's blow my paycheck. But I realized that money was not really making me happy. Job satisfaction was zero in D.C. And D.C., as you know, is a very uh, radical place. It's completely woke. So I found that I was in disagreement with a lot of my friends over there. And those same, I would say, friends today, I'll quote one publicly wrote on my Facebook that it was people like me, and I quote, who want my country, India, to burn. The context, I had made an explainer video on the CAA. She was anti-CAA. She told me, People like you want my country to burn. And I was like, really? Like, I moved here from America to cover positive development, and I really doubt somebody like me would want the country to burn, right? And when I questioned her on this, on my Facebook page, and a bunch of other friends that I had, they supported her, and they actually threatened to take me out of my Harvard alumni group, something that I paid a lot of money to get into, right? The issue got uh, escalated, and I actually wrote about that experience in the Indian Express. Bottom line, what I found was that these people were far from objective and far from logical, let alone being friends, right? Now, these same people that I see, they can't even describe what a woman is, 
if you ask them to define it or what a man is. Because of such divisive politics and ideology, right? I would say because of such dangerous ideals where there's no objectivity or no logic to what you're saying, you guys today have a choice between normal or crazy. There's no problem supporting whoever you want to support, but be logical and agree to disagree. Because it's only your knowledge, your experience, your values, your common sense, and the respect that you have for India that will guide you towards the right path. And it's not just for you. It's actually for our children. Like I think Sachin sir, I want to thank him personally because my baby is, I think, 18 months old. And she was crying, crying, crying. So I missed my first flight. And then I had to rush to get here. And I just want to thank you for having me here today. Because it's important. I think our children also deserve the truth and adults who act as role models and uphold their beliefs and value systems. We don't need more idiots in the world, right? What our children don't deserve is a crazy mob that's intentionally spreading hate and anti-India sentiment. Instead, political leaders often use social media platforms to spread their divisive messages, right? That's all they use it for. It is not to inform, which is the point of social media in the first place. I'm glad that you guys are aware of it. A lot of you are nodding your heads. So you guys know this. Now that you know this, I think that we all have to work together, right? And put an end to this. I think as responsible citizens, it's our duty to promote peace, unity, and mutual respect. We must also hold social media platforms accountable. Like you see what's happening with Twitter and Vijaya Gade, who is the former legal head, right? She's getting roasted right now because of basically all the nonsense she did over the past few years. And I just like to say these people will be called out. When I spoke to a lot of you, I don't know what you guys feel about it, but during the campaign, I was like, why don't you call this out? If you don't agree with it, why aren't you talking about it on social media? We're scared. Right? We're scared of what people on our campus will say. We don't want to be alienated. We don't want to be, you know, not popular. We don't want to, I got a bunch of different answers. There was one troll, I don't think anyone can beat this though, no matter how you're troll. There was one troll that said, I had said something or I put an explainer video out. I was pregnant at the time, seven months during COVID, peak COVID. This guy said, I hope the baby doesn't get any oxygen inside of you, and I hope that that baby dies. Isn't that sick? I mean, it's absolutely sick. There are people like this out there. I mean, whether you agree with me or not, who would want that, right? And that's when I got scared as well. That's when I was a little fearful. I was like, you know, it's, it's a little scary. But where you find a lot of trolls, you also find a lot of support, right? Those two people who are my original founding, I would say, followers, my parents, right? My husband, and a bunch of other people. They caught that troll. They put out an FIR against him. They called him out, and he had to publicly apologize. And he actually personally called me and apologized and said, I'm sorry, I'll never do this with anyone again. So don't be fearful of being alienated. If you're alienated, it's still fine, because you're sticking up for what's right. You'll find a lot of support along the way. And I think that this, no matter how many followers you have, whether it's two, whether it's 10, whether it's thousands, it starts at the individual level. And if we don't become responsible now, it's just going to get more divisive, which is going to lead to more cultural attacks. And that's all I'll have to say. Thank you so much. Namaste. Thank you so much, ma'am. I think we will be moving on to the much-awaited question and answer session. Um, I will begin with the first question and keep the session open for the audience. In a college campus and most of us are students, would you like to put some light on uh, campus activism? <coughs> yeah, I mean, <coughs> I mean, it's not a college campus if there is no activism happening. But the question is, like what Priyanka said, I mean, this idea that uh, there is a university which is named after the first prime minister of the country and which is, you know, where education is being offered to the learners in highly subsidized manner and the, you know, the students who are pursuing <coughs> the doctoral programs in the university, when they are arranging some programs, 
even the slogans which they are giving those slogans are outrightly and brazenly anti india i mean you are you are at the top of receiving all the facilities and all the concessions and the best of the education that is being given by any university in the country i i, I am referring to the jawaharlal nehru university campus and the same you know that most uh, malignant breakthrough that happened on the uh, 9th of february 2015 and then all of a sudden you know the common people also they uh, although the problem had been persisting for quite some time but then that was a breakthrough and then we understood all of a sudden we woke up how could this happen people of the country i mean dr b r ambedkar all his life was dedicated to political dissent and it was because of ambedkar and the likes of phule and the likes of periyar and others that you know as a society we could understand how to move ahead by shedding off all the negativity and all the discrimination and how to evolve and become a better society in the in today's world but ambedkar himself never ever even in the slightest manner in his entire literature not even once he criticizes the nation of ours i mean that's what kind of tendency is that you are late to attend a program the organizers of the program they delay the beginning of the program and then somebody just comes and says hey 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 ist indian standard time why put that shit on that country of yours india is a country that understands time in the best manner possible we don't understand time only as a commodity or just a matter of convenience we don't understand time only as a watch or as a calendar for us time is something that you know goes much ahead and we in hindi we say hum to samay ki anantata mein jeete hai that is how we understand time and then when somebody gets late somewhere he just puts that blame on the country of ours and says that this is indian standard time i mean see this is a petty thing to mention but then look at the idea that goes that conveys that gets it's, it's very stereotypical it's very stereotypical so campus activism is the life of campus but then that campus activism must take place because you know i mean if you are not a vibrant lot of people in this age then like when are you going to become vibrant i don't think arjuna was an octogenarian or a you know septuagenarian he was not in his 70s when krishna asks him to pick up the gandhi and then you know pull the string and then fix the arrow and then shoot and kill his own pitama they were pretty young at that time right so i mean all our traditional cultural ethos it teaches us energy and energy being directed for the constructive causes for the constructive causes i'm referring to that again and again and i'll keep reiterating that so it is not a campus if there is no activism happening but the activism must be must be unto the larger end do we have some loopholes in our society yes we do we have poverty we have inequalities we have discrimination we have casteism we have um, the divide between the, uh, the the man and the woman and so on there are different norms of society for the male child there are different norms of the society for the female child accept the reality accept the reality find out the problems diagnose the problems your ways and find the solutions in your ways so that you won't have to depend on any lousy theory coming your way disrupting the scene you know that is the reason after independence we have been studying social sciences for last 75 years but the social sciences have not been instrumental in bringing any desirable social reformation in our society what are we doing in universities social sciences and the academics of social sciences would be an instrument would be a very competent instrument to bring in the desirable social reformation only when the indigenous problems are understood and diagnosed in the local manner and the solutions to those problems are provided in a local manner first of all develop the guts in you to feel proud of yourself as an indian in every narrative and in every thought that comes in your mind about the great country of yours campus activism is welcome always provided the direction that it has that direction constructs you constructs the society and constructs that great nation of ours and then all of us together we could move ahead with that activism thank you hello my question is to deshpande ji uh, like recently there was a article uh, article 
like communists are looting the temples like in the kerala so my question is that why can't we free the hindu temples from the, by the state well from state control the basically. question doesn't refer to my area of expertise because a lot of you know legislation and a proper knowledge of certain laws and norms is required for that but then as a layman i can only reflect um, by saying that uh, you know we first of all we need to understand that you know the organization and the administration of the temples because most of our temples are state owned at present and there is then there is a commission for example the devasthanam of tirupati has a commission and it has a commissioner and an is officer looks after the uh, expenditure and everything the income that happens to the devasthanam so as a layman i only feel and as a hindu i only feel that the temples must be freed from the control of the state machinery as simple as that interestingly the um, religious organizations and the establishments of the minorities they are not subjected to the norm of any such administrative control on the finance and that is why their audit doesn't happen so that's a that's a lopsided situation and we call our country a secular country i don't know whatever that means okay so it's a secular country but the uh, but the religious establishments of the minorities their finance will not be controlled but the majority uh, populations religious establishments their finance will be controlled welcome to secularism Uh, good afternoon sir my name is kunal shindgi so my question is for both of you uh, our students are depending on the western culture and the western people are moving to indian culture as uh, the hottest topic is right now that hindu rashtra uh, the problem is that people think when it comes to hindu rashtra both the western people and our own indian people they are uh, objecting it but if we uh, consider india as a islamic state they are all happy why is that our students uh, devoting towards the western culture Do you guys know of a professor Audrey Trushke? Someone was laughing so I'm assuming yes very well <laughs> right Now imagine Trushke yeah that's a good one uh, Rutgers University is in New Jersey it's been there for several decades if not I think a century more than a century Trushke is a permanent professor there imagine how many students she would have taught during her tenure and how many students she is still teaching who have never been to india who have never experienced india who are not part of the hindu religion not part of the culture not part of the heritage cannot speak the language they will blindly believe what she says and if the problem is it's that's why i said that it always starts at the individual right every person that she teaches keeps having the wrong and disruptive and dangerous ideals and now it has turned into divisive politics that is getting dangerous this is why a lot of people are following blindly right which is why people like you and students like you need to call it out because people like us are dependent on people like you to support us we're putting ourselves out there and getting all the trolls but we need you to come up and support as well that's why the shift is happening well there was some question about hindu rashtra uh, i mean were you asking that i mean we when we try to think of bharat as hindu rashtra then there are people who criticize don't think of bharat as hindu rashtra don't think of making bharat a hindu rashtra something which is already there we don't remake it as simple as that okay so it's it's very clear it's it's very clear um, then there are people you said uh, thankfully for you know for for their uh, uh, luck uh, i haven't come across with those people who would be happy if i consider uh, bharat as a uh, islamic nation uh, but then uh, i really sympathize with you like uh, something that you must have <laughs> uh to be very honest okay uh, well uh, please pardon me uh, i'm not much of a social media guy so for me activism means real activism that happens on the field and um, uh, we have one professor who comes from the indian knowledge system tradition uh, we talked about it the shastrartha traditions uh, that are there if you if you really want you know to have some kind of uh, intellectual engagement with that person who has okay respect his views uh, ring him up uh, call him for some 
debate or discussion, arrange a group of some 50 people and then have that discussion on, you know, what would be the trajectory of making Bharat a Islamic nation and then uh, what would be, yeah, and wa what we are in reality. So, I mean, Instagram is like, that's a very slippery kind of field to be very honest. Of course, it does make an impact. It does make an impact, but then uh, I have my own reservations about engaging oneself for, you know, really very heated discussions on social media platforms because ultimately it leads to nothing to the best of my understanding. But I would definitely love to, you know, have real debates on the real field with people. Nowadays, nobody really fight with swords and weapons. Everybody can't do that, right? So you need to engage yourself, uh, if not swords, if not with swords, then with words, certainly, right? So that, that's all I can say. But you need to develop that combative spirit in you for the better or worse. You need to develop that combative, combative spirit, absolutely. Pay them back in the same coin, and then they will shut up once and for all. Yes. Good afternoon to the panelists. My question is for Priyanka, ma'am. Uh, when you talked about the uh, uh, attacks, so the attacks which happen on social media, that is uh, usually because you are thinking different from others. I mean, the comments which you got, which you got, because you are thinking different than, different than the masses, your uh, your thinking is different than them. So how do you cope up when you receive those trolls? Because it, it happens at a macro level, happens at a micro level too when someone is thinking different than their classmates, they are you know, targeted or so what is the better way to someone has a different approach? It's a tough one, right? Because you get affected by it personally. But like in the speech, did. I mean, did you see the level of comment that was? Like, imagine the guy's mind uh, that you're that sick that you think of, you know, I don't agree with her on the CAA, so I hope the oxygen doesn't reach her baby and she dies. Right? There are really sick people out there, right? R really, really sick thoughts. What I can tell you is that I used to be afraid as well. I, you know, I got fearful with that comment, especially being seven months pregnant. I was like, should I go to work? Should I not go to work? What should I do? Should I put out more videos? What if something happens? But I found right after someone made that comment, I didn't even have to comment back on it. I didn't even have to flag it. There were so many, there were about 20 comments of my followers and whoever watched my video that called him out, right? So, where you're fearful, right? I would say don't be fearful of that because it's something that I wasted a lot of time doing, being scared to speak up. And now I'm not scared at all because I know that friends who you know, make these types of comments, they're not friends, right? You can get better friends and I think it's time to get better friends, right? And you will find those friends. It's, I mean, what is the country? 90% Hindu, 95% Hindu, 80% Hindu? 79, yeah, I think I thought it was 77. That's what the figure I had in my mind. But I think it's 79% Hindu. And most likely they have the same thoughts as you, but they're scared to speak up, right? You'll find that when you speak up, a lot of people will start following you, right? At a macro level, at a micro level as well. So don't be afraid to do it. And the time to do it is now, because this is just going to get, there's going to be more and more attacks, right? On behalf of Prabuddha Bharat, I thank speakers for elucidating the session. And as a token of appreciation, I now request Ms. Pooja to present the mementos to the esteemed speakers. I also thank the audience for being a patient listener. I conclude this session and moving further to the following session, indeed a very interesting session of UR Voice, I request Kumari Harshita Prasad to take over.